Hi everyone, don't be fooled by the title of this video. It's obviously impossible to explain a musician as complex as Bach in only 10 minutes. What I am instead going to do is to focus on one very short composition by Bach and from there talk about some of the things that I think are most profound and significant about his music. The piece I'm going to talk about is taken from the Goldberg Variations, the canon at the unison. In case you're not familiar with the Goldberg Variations, this gigantic work is a virtual encyclopedia of early 18th century keyboard styles, running through virtually every imaginable type of dance, technical device, and expressive atmosphere. Unusually for a set of variations, there is no theme per se, but rather a bass progression that runs through the entire work and upon which all 30 variations are founded. As is characteristic of Bach, the Goldberg variations are thorough, exhaustive, and comprehensive. On its own, this would have been a remarkable achievement, but Bach goes a step farther. Every third variation is a canon, that is, the two upper voices are written in strict imitation. And in each successive variation, the interval separating the two upper voices gets larger by one step. Thus, the third variation is a canon at the unison, the sixth variation is a canon at the second, the ninth variation is a canon at the third, and so on. These canons are, for me, among the most interesting parts of the entire work. Because of the huge technical challenges involved in writing canons on every interval, all upon the same bass progression, style is inevitably subordinated to the punishing demands placed upon it. This is not a unique feature in Bach's keyboard works, which are dotted with pieces that deliberately push a given technical idea to its very limits. Subjecting his language to the most extreme duress, the composer's imagination forced to operate under the most constrictive of straitjackets in an almost unbelievable feat of technical ingenuity. I believe this is Bach attempting to touch the divine, holding a mirror to the perfection of the heavenly realm. Let me give you a few examples of this strand within Bach's keyboard works. The mirror canons in The Art of the Fugue are two interrelated pieces that are exact mirrors of each other. In the second piece, all the voices are inverted or turned upside down, and yet the harmony and melody still functions perfectly. Another example would be the organ preludes of the Orgebüchlein, the little organ book. These short pieces take simple Lutheran hymn tunes as the starting point for the most extraordinary contrapuntal wizardry, such that the tunes themselves are transformed from being the focal point into a background element, lost in a maze, as it were. The puzzle canons of the musical offering are famous for their contrapuntal arcana, these pieces all based upon the fiendishly awkward theme that was supposedly given to Bach by Frederick the Great of Prussia feature such devices as crab cannons, which are essentially musical palindromes, or an endlessly rising canon with no definitive ending. All of these pieces, and there are many others, consolidated Bach's claim to being a consummate master of musical science, taking the art of counterpoint to its very limits. In this sense, they have much in common with more recent constraint-based artworks. The Ulipo, the Ouvreur de Littérature Potentielle, was a group of mainly French writers founded in 1960 who wanted to see what it was possible to do when language is subjected to absurd, arbitrary constraints, such as Georges Perec's novel La Disparition, which was written entirely without the use of the letter E. Amazingly, this novel was then successfully translated into English, observing the same constraint. More recently, the poet Christian Book spent seven years writing the extraordinary Eunoia, a book in which every vowel is allowed to appear, but only one at a time. So there's chapter A that only uses the letter A, chapter E that only uses the letter E, and so on. That's only one of many constraints involved in the writing of this book, which made its author justly famous. The UK poet Anthony Etheren has engaged in similarly uncanny poetic stunts, writing, for example, poems that are perfect anagrams of each other and that are also palindromes. His books Stray Arts and Slate Petals are exhaustive compendiums of some of the most stupefying feats I've ever seen. But let's get back to the Goldberg Variations and the canon at the unison. These pieces do something remarkable, something that, I believe, is a kind of compositional ideal. They combine the formal and the informal, weaving together the strict and the free. It is as though Bach is telling us that the heavenly realm and the earthly realm need not remain separated. They can be brought together. But how does this work in a technical sense? In this piece, the top two voices are in strict canonic imitation. That is, they are identical to each other, but separated by a distance of one bar. The bass, however, is free. It is woven around the two other voices. Nearly all the canons in the Goldberg Variations are put together this way, the one exception being the canon at the ninth, which has no bass line at all. The piece begins with a two-part texture that is disarmingly simple and song-like. And if 
it's played at a slightly slower tempo, it resembles closely the adagio from the D minor oboe concerto with its descending stepwise progression. At first, we have no reason to expect this texture to change, but in bar two, the music suddenly turns into a bizarre hall of mirrors, endlessly replicating itself, until the initial lyrical idea is simply lost in all the profusion. Line, initially a completely neutral accompaniment entirely in arpeggios, eventually lapses into a bizarre stream of consciousness ramble, only referring back to its initial form at the very end with a perfunctory closing arpeggio. <laughs> It's a brilliant sleight of hand and one of the strangest, most compelling moments in Bach's entire keyboard output. The upper voices, being unison copies of each other, inevitably get tangled up, being forced to occupy the same registral space and are constantly crossing. The result is that it can be hard to tell which is the copy and which is the original. So how does one go about writing something like this? Let's boil the piece down to its simplest, most skeletal presentation. If we simplify the bass line, we quickly see that it is simply the very famous Goldberg bass progression. So this is the skeleton upon which the canon must be built. Now, if we simplify the leader or the upper of the two canonic voices, we see that it is written in such a manner that it must be harmonically coherent when repeated one bar later. Bach starts with a harmonic skeleton, in other words, making sure that the pitches that are most crucial to determining the harmonic context are coherent, and then he fleshes it out with figurations. Because of the difficulty of making a unison canon work with this bass line, the piece has some strange features. Already in bar two, a C natural in the lower voice is heard in close proximity to a C sharp in the bass, implying two different and incompatible harmonic functions. Also in bar two, the bass and the lower of the two canonic voices fall into hidden parallel fifths. We barely notice it though because of the figurations in the lower voice. Notice how in bar four, the F sharp in the upper voice suddenly falls silent, rather continuing to the expected resolution on G. Bach has to omit the G as its imitation one bar later would otherwise result in an unprepared dissonance. As the technical constraints get more arcane and extreme, Bach's music seems to travel backwards in time, as the vertical dimension and the coercive power of the cadence are weakened. For me, these tiny pieces reveal an astonishingly vast worldview, one that unites philosophy, theology, musical science, pedagogy, all in the guise of supremely beautiful compositions that fascinate us as much today as they did when they were first written. If you like what I do, you can help me to keep on doing it by becoming a patron of my YouTube channel and podcast. It's easy and fast, and you can do it for as little as $5 a month. Rewards include exclusive downloads, books, CDs, and more. I also offer personalized composition and analysis lessons on Zoom. For more information, check the links in the video description.